Good afternoon, fellow Fulbrighters. What an honor it is to serve you as chair of the board of directors. And what a pleasure it is to be with you this afternoon. As you will see on this slide, the agenda for this afternoon begins with me and then our executive director, John Bader, followed by our treasurer, Will Vokey. Please hold your questions until the end. We live in a constantly changing world and we as Fulbrighters are quite adaptable, but we will not change our mission to continue and extend the Fulbright tradition of education, advocacy, and service, or our vision to be a catalyst for a peaceful and interconnected world inspired by international educational exchange, or what we value. We respect all peoples and cultures, value diversity, and are committed to international education and mutual understanding. As the first awardee of the Fulbright Prize, Nelson Mandela said, quote, we can change the world and make it a better place. It is in our hands to make a difference, unquote. The board has taken those words, our vision, our mission, and what we value to heart in making the investment of time and resources to do what Fulbrighters do, make a positive difference in the world. Our association is growing and becoming better. This month, we are saying thank you to our hardworking and committed departing board members, Allison Gardy, Melody Horton, Ann Lewis, Jay Nathan, and Oku Rowe, and welcoming new board members who are just as hardworking and committed, Samantha Frank, Eric Lopez, and Matthew Shank. Last March, we honored Bono with the Fulbright Prize and everyone present will attest to what a grand time we had. On April 19th of next year, we are honoring Dr. Anthony Fauci and Dr. Kizmekia Corbett for their global COVID work at the Grand Regency in Washington, DC. Now, if you miss the event in 2022, make sure you don't miss 2023. And if you were present in 2022, I know you will be back in 2023. We need your help to make this event a resounding success by getting sponsors and donors. But most of all, we want to see you there. Advocacy Day will, <clears throat> excuse me, Advocacy Day will follow the Fulbright Prize event the next day. So please plan to stay for both days. In October, you will remember that we met in Bethesda, Maryland at our first in-person conference in three years. The theme was aptly called Reunion and what a reunion it was. It was kicked off by an intriguing keynote speech from the Ukrainian ambassador to the United States, the Honorable Oksana Makarova, followed by a thought-provoking and educational panel moderated by the former Hungarian ambassador to the US and a fellow Fulbrighter and a member of our board, Reka Zimmerkinja. From October 19th to 23rd, our 2023 conference will be held in the Mile High City, Denver, Colorado. Denver is a beautiful city with world-class museums, first-rate breweries, and more than 200 parks within the city, including Red Rocks Park and Amphitheater. Denver will also host the White House City Summit a few months prior to our conference. 
So please mark your calendars now to join us for another exciting conference. Again, we need your help in locating sponsors to partner with us and we want each and every one of you to register to attend. Please think also about the programs that you can submit. It won't be long before the call for proposals will go out. We also need reviewers and that call will also go out. While the board has been working to be consistently efficient and effective, we are now making sure we institutionalize best practices. We have added a diversity and inclusion committee that has been working to include all peoples and cultures and to expose underrepresented groups to Fulbright through Fulbright in the Classroom, among other community outreaches. We have also added a committee devoted to developing more resources so we can continue with excellent programming. We cannot continue to spread the Fulbright brand without raising the requisite funds. Someone once said, vision without action is merely a dream. Action without vision just passes the time. Vision with action can change the world. And so I end with another quote by Fulbright Prize Laureate Nelson Mandela. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Let us continue to work together to make the world a better place. Thank you. And now we will hear more about activities in 2022 from our executive director, John Bader. Hello, everyone. It's a delight to join you today. Uh, it's always difficult to follow Justice Baldwin uh, in the speaking order uh, because uh, She's uh, a wonderfully inspiring uh, leader, and I'm grateful for her support, partnership, and mentorship, of course. Um, I want to welcome you, all of our members, uh, to this, uh, this afternoon's uh, webinar to talk about uh, the, the year behind and the year ahead. Uh, I'm just going to add a few details to some of the things that uh, Cynthia highlighted to begin with. First, uh, the prize to Bono was an extraordinary game-changing experience for all of us. And as she suggested, something you, you must be part of moving forward. We had uh, uh, 20 members of Congress in the room. That has never happened at a Fulbright Association gathering, to my knowledge. Uh, it uh, was uh, a very important moment for us in that regards. Um, uh, about 30 countries were represented, most of them by their uh, ambassadors, uh, so creating a, a unique gathering point between members of Congress, Fulbright, and the Diplomatic Corps, a, a very exciting um, uh, experience. Uh, almost 500 people were there, uh, a very diverse group, um, uh, sponsors, donors, alumni, students. It was uh, an energized and excited room. Um, one of the uh, significant advantages of, of launching the Fulbright Prize in this manner is that it advances our advocacy strategies. Uh, that led directly, we believe, uh, to uh, increased proposals by the House Appropriations Committee for an additional $10 million on top of current spending and an additional $15 million from Senate appropriations. So um, uh, a, uh, an extraordinary moment that way. And as Cynthia mentioned, also an important fundraiser for all the programs that we do year round. Advocacy month followed by Zoom. This was our, uh, uh, really our last, at least uh, for now, Zoom approach to advocacy moving forward, we'll be uh, transitioning back to in-person advocacy. But we had many, many meetings. They went exceptionally well. We want to thank all of you who participated in those as leaders and as team members. Um, those two figures for appropriations are not yet resolved. Uh, we are still waiting for Congress to uh, make final appropriations decisions, but we certainly hope that those monies uh, will 
uh, be found in the actual appropriation bill. Chapters were uh, did amazing work in 2022, and I, I want to raise them up. Many of you on this call are chapter leaders. Uh, we're so grateful for your hard work and volunteerism, uh, keeping the Fulbright um, flame alive. Uh, this year, uh, a return to in-person programming funded in large part by the um, Bureau of, Econ of uh, Educational and Cultural Affairs, uh, ECA. Our, our partners there have been supporting our work for many years with generous grants, and uh, this is one example how chapter activities are funded by uh, ECA. Uh, we continue to develop our Great Decisions program, which is a um, in partnership with another uh, NGO uh, to uh, to create educated, interesting uh, debate spaces. We offered chapter awards at our conference, which were that evening was a great highlight uh, for the conference, where we awarded the uh, uh, the list that you can see on the screen before you. Um, it was it was such an exciting evening and so great to focus our attention on uh, chapters and chapter leadership and their accomplishments throughout the year. So many thanks for them. The next day, uh, again, funded by an ECA grant, we offered uh, a chapter leader workshop at the conference. Um, this was a terrific working session uh, in which they uh, exchanged best practices and supported each other on a very important uh, theme of those conversations was the emphasis on diversity and inclusion, a high priority for everyone across the country. And we continue to work with our chapters uh, to uh, execute on creating a more welcoming uh, and more representative community, both within the association and for the Fulbright program itself. Some more accomplishments from 2022 include the start of six. Uh, new interest groups. These are country-based interest groups. Uh, as we expand on our existing strong geographic chapters, we want to connect people in other ways and their affiliation with a given country, in this case, Italy, Israel, Ireland, Spain, Norway, and Taiwan, uh, have all created interest groups with volunteer boards. It's, uh, it's exciting to see the programming that they're developing moving forward. Um, Fulbright in the Classroom continues to thrive. We had a, a grant that we distributed this year to volunteers uh, across the country. Uh, they are doing all kinds of uh, presentations all over the, uh, all over the United States. Uh, the reporting on this is so inspiring, so we're grateful to all of them for participating and for all of you who have done that without the grant uh, throughout the year. Um, Cynthia mentioned uh, some of the exciting features of the conference. I mentioned the chapter leadership workshop and the chapter awards. Others include that we had over 100 presentations and breakout sessions uh, at the conference. She mentioned the uh, plenary session with the ambassador. Also want to mention the Cohen dance uh, performance and lecture by Dr. Janaki Nair. Uh, who is a, a world-renowned Katakali dancer, unusual because Katakali dancers are typically men. Uh, and she, uh, she has been breaking boundaries um, uh, for, for many years, and we're glad that she could join us in person. Uh, we also uh, wanted to highlight, as we often do, our artistic community. So we offered a virtual art exhibit that was very popular. Uh, two more important program points. Uh, one is that our travel program returned with uh, with great enthusiasm with a wonderful trip to Slovenia. Uh, as I'll be mentioning in just a moment, that program will continue next year with trips to Spain and Portugal and to Canada. Uh, we launched a mentor program. This has been uh, asked for for many years, and we had never had gotten around to doing this uh, with a small team uh, and limited resources. We can't do all the great ideas that we'd like to, but in this case, we executed on this in part with the good help of Nada Glick, a former board member and longtime career counselor. Um, we based this on the, uh, the interest groups uh, that I mentioned just a minute ago, uh, and they have been very successful. We have over 100 mentor-mentee pairings 
and they've been reporting a lot of great conversations. So we're trying to figure out how to scale that up to, to support more mentoring relationships moving forward. Um, just a quick introduction for those of you who don't know who um, we are on the professional team here in Washington, uh, myself, um, my director for national events, Alicia Montague, uh, our director for data and communications, Munir Sayeh, who is like myself, an alumnus, alumnus and um, Claire Jagla, who uh, directs our philanthropy and fundraising efforts. Claire is also a Fulbrighter. Christine Oswald, who supports uh, chapters across the country, um, and Fiona Breslin, who is often your first contact point when you reach out to our office. She manages our membership campaigns and services, and she also uh, is our office manager. Uh, this is an amazing team. We have been, uh, the six of us together since uh, last October, so we've been together for more than a year. Uh, and uh, it's a great joy and pleasure to be part of this talented group of men and women. A couple more notes before I hand it over to uh, to Will Vokey on finances. Um, first is uh, looking forward to 2023. Um, uh, some highlights that I, I hope that you'll be part of and will support and participate. The first would be in March and, excuse me, in February and March, we will be doing advocacy at the grassroots local level, uh, engaging chapters and chapter leaders in uh, uh, creating uh, opportunities to share Fulbright stories in the offices of uh, local, uh, of congressional uh, teams. For example, the Minnesota chapter would organize a, uh, a meeting with uh, Senator Klobuchar's staff and perhaps Klobuchar herself uh, in Minneapolis. Uh, so that's we'll be doing that in every chapter. That's almost 60 chapters across the country, uh, which would be a very powerful way to demonstrate that Fulbright has a local impact uh, and makes a difference every day. Uh, Cynthia mentioned the Fulbright Prize to Drs. Fauci and Corbett on April 19th. That's going to be another great event we hope you'll participate in. Um, next month, we'll be uh, offering tickets uh, for that event. Uh, sponsorships are available right now. You can simply contact prize at fulbright.org, prize at fulbright.org, if you're interested. Um, the next day, April 20th, is uh, Advocacy Day. Uh, that way, you could come to Washington for the prize, stay overnight. Uh, join us uh, uh, walking the hill uh, the next day and meeting with congressional leaders and staff and then head home. Uh, so we think that will be a, a fantastic joining of two important programs for us. I mentioned the travel program to Spain and Portugal, which is in May. We already have a number of people registering for, for that uh, uh, wonderful program. Uh, uh, targeting places in Spain and Portugal that are not uh, as commonly visited uh, as, uh, as, as you might uh, expect. So we hope that you'll register for that and join some great Fulbrighters in, in, that, uh, in that experience. Then in the fall, in September, to the Canadian Maritimes, uh, a beautiful, stunning part of the country. Again, uh, in the company of Fulbrighters, uh, can't ask for more than that. Cynthia also mentioned the conference in Denver. We're really excited about that. We have decided to try to rotate our conference destinations a little bit more re regularly and predictably uh, than we have in the past. Uh, so we'll be uh, uh, in Washington year one, uh, as we were uh, this fall, then in year two, uh, somewhere else in the country, in this case, Denver, partnering with the fantastic Colorado chapter. Uh, and then in year three, an international destination. We're still working on those details, but um, and then back to Washington once again. So uh, we look forward to seeing you in, in Denver in October. Um, of course, all of you can enjoy chapter events throughout the year. Um, I'm expecting to, that our chapters will offer upwards of 200 uh, in-person events next year. Um, again, uh, ECA grants make a big difference here. Um, and But critically, uh, your 
leadership and your attendance at those events um, make them successful. So thank you for, for staying engaged and being involved at the local level. Uh, we'll continue to offer the Fulbright Forum, our webinar series on a variety of topics. Uh, we uh, welcome proposals for, uh, for forums uh, throughout the year. We want to uh, offer continual programming and uh, the forum is, is one of the best ways to do that. And finally, we're looking for uh, an expansion of the Fulbright in the Classroom program. We're applying for a, a major grant from a large foundation. Uh, we're excited about the possibilities there. Uh, uh, but regardless of that, uh, that funding, we want uh, more and more Fulbrighters to think about taking their understanding of the world, their love of the international, their experiences as Fulbrighters into their communities, uh, uh, K through college. Uh, we're especially interested in targeting underrepresented communities, but really any, any student would be inspired by your story. So please let us know if that's uh, of interest to you. And then finally, just to tie things up for, for um, my section of this presentation, and glad to take your questions uh, submitted in the Q&A. You're welcome to do that. Um, and Cynthia, Will, and I will get to those after he is done. Um, you can read them yourself, but I'll run through them anyway. Um, it's uh, to stay involved. We need to know who you are. So be sure that we have uh, updated information on your profile. You can always add detail to that. Uh, and it always helps us to better understand our membership and, and your needs. Of course, we always appreciate promoting the Fulbright Association to your friends, your cohort of Fulbrighters, uh, and your university. Uh, we have a category, Friends of Fulbright, uh, which of course means anybody who believes in the, uh, the power of international exchange and wants to get involved in our programming, uh, wants to come to our conference, attend the prize, be involved in chapters, all of that stuff. So you may have a next door neighbor or a friend at, uh, at work who loves this stuff. Um, uh, you're, you may be affiliated with a university that may or may not be a member now, and we'd love to partner with them and get, uh, get engaged in, in that way. So your help is, is most appreciated. Um, chapters, uh, of course, I mentioned both chapters and interest groups. There are lots of ways to stay connected to each other, to be involved uh, at the local level. We, uh, we rely on our volunteer community to drive that forward, and uh, we hope you'll be involved with that. Um, we mentioned coming to the Fulbright Prize, helping us with sponsorships. Um, again, uh, critically important to fund our programming and to advance our mission. So any help you can lend, uh, we, we're grateful. Um, uh, call, answer the call for advocacy. So. If your chapter is organizing that local visit, if you're interested in coming to Washington for Advocacy Day, please sign up, uh, stay connected. Our unified voices to speak uh, and stand for Fulbright are, are so important. It's, it's a critical role that we play to ensure the program's future. Sign up for Fulbright in the Classroom. You'll see this on our website, fulbright.org. You can click on programs and find Fulbright in the classroom. There's a toolkit available there, uh, lots of ways to get involved uh, and to, to uh, uh, connect with your local community. Propose and attend a Fulbright Forum. Again, uh, these are ongoing webinar series. We want you involved. We want to hear your voice. We want to do that better year on year. Cynthia mentioned uh, paying attention to the conference. Um, uh, announcements that will come up in the spring. Um, you know, the, the, those conferences are amazing uh, celebration of the diversity and uh, interdisciplinary nature of the Fulbright community. You got to go and check this out. I mean, if you've never been to one of these, you have missed, we have missed out and, and we hope that you'll be involved and, and come and join us. And finally, to donate, to support our programs and mission. We have donors uh, who give $5 a year. We have donors who do much more than that. But every donor is valued uh, because that's, that's how we move forward. Um, uh, running a, a nonprofit is, uh, is like running a small business. You need 
uh, you need revenue to cover your expenses. Um, and uh, we appreciate all the support that we get. Um, and of course, we want to close out the year strong. So any donations before uh, December 31st are most appreciated. If you can't get around to that, that's fine. Another time. Um, we, we're we very grateful to you. Um, okay, finally, my thanks, and then I'll turn it over to Will. Um, we we want to thank you, our individual members, as well as our institutional members, um, critical partners in all that we do. We are a member organization, uh, and therefore, our thanks always have to start with our members. Um, I mentioned the importance of those who support us financially, donors, sponsors, ECA, critically important. Membership dues, of course, also support what we do. Um, chapter leaders and boards, um, we want to continue to raise up this amazing volunteer community as often as we can, uh, as we did at that chapter leader um, uh, award dinner. But uh, every day is 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 a great day for our volunteers. Advocacy volunteers, of course, uh, critically important to to ensuring the program's future. As I said, our hardworking national board members. Uh, uh, Cynthia and Will among them, <laughs> but uh, we have a large, engaged, important, and impressive national board. They work really hard on committees, on projects. Um, they uh, they are lead donors. They are partners to me. They are advisors to uh, to me and my team. They help us move forward strategically and financially, and I'm grateful to them. Uh, and then finally, our uh, travel program subcommittee members. Um, uh, our travel program continues to thrive thanks to their leadership and engagement, and we look forward to working with them uh, moving forward. Okay, well, uh, again, um, feel free to add uh, questions to the Q&A. Uh, we'll get to those uh, when Will is uh, has completed his remarks. Uh, so let me introduce you to Will Vokey, our treasurer, and uh, um, Give him the floor. Thank you, Will. Thank you, John. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. That was a, an exciting and uplifting snapshot of what's happened with Fulbright Association in the last year. Um, and uh, my report, as always, is a little bit more sobering because it's about the finances. And I want to give you a, a fairly as complete as I can understanding of where things stand this year. So I'm going to have a couple slides, but first let me make a couple of points. Um, it was a great year in programming. It was not as great a year financially. Uh, and there are three reasons for that. Uh, one is external. The external reasons, of course, are the pandemic, COVID, um, and the economy. And those have had an impact upon our income streams. Uh, the second reason it wasn't as great a year financially as we had hoped was that we have been in the learning process. We've been learning about uh, what it takes to put on an event like the prize that we did this year. There had not been a domestic prize given at that kind of level for a number of years. Um, we're learning about that. We're learning, we learned, for instance, that um, the registrations for the prize weren't as strong as we expected them to be, even though we had 500 people. Um, and that the sponsorships were stronger than we expected them to be, but they cannibalized a little bit our sponsorships for our national conference. So those are all things that we have learned. And the staff has learned that and the staff is incorporating that into the budget for 2023. The final reason that it wasn't a great financial year is that the board has decided to embark upon a process of growth, um, not dramatic growth, but growth, to try to have more impact through advocacy, through programming, for the vision and mission of Fulbright. And there are three pieces to that. We have gone with a full-time staff of six for the first time. So this is the first full year we've had a full-time staff of six, of course, adding to expenses. Um, we decided to do the prize every year. It had been done in an in kind of an alternate year, almost random fashion before. And by doing it every year, we create both a large expense and a large opportunity for income. And the third thing we've done is in order to meet those kinds of financial expectations, we've instituted a development committee of the board who are helping John uh, figure out how to generate the appropriate income. 
All that leads up, however, to the report that this year is projected to be a deficit. So I want to go into the more of the details on the finances now. And John, if you would give me the next slide. This is just an overall kind of summary of where our money comes from. Memberships, donation, and events are the three big areas. And this is the 22 projected income. Of events, the prize is about three quarters of the events in terms of the event income. Let me mention a minute <clears throat> the endowment. Uh, you see an endowment draw of about 8% of the income. That's about $100,000. The board guideline on the endowment is to only draw income, income meaning dividends and interest. Uh, the reason for that is that we don't want to dip into the principal and use the prize, excuse me, and use the endowment as kind of a, um, a kitty bank to dip into whenever we need to. Unfortunately, we may have to dip into it this year, but the general endowment draw is 90% of the income from the endowment. Of course, the endowment this year has fluctuated dramatically. The endowment was 5.6 million in December 31st last year. It went down as low as 4.4 million, given the economy. Um, and it's back up now. I don't have those latest figures, but it's back up in the 4.8 range. Next slide, John. This is the overall sense of where our money goes. Most of our money goes to program services with administrating administration and fundraising taking up another significant chunk. Now, I'm not gonna deal more with that, but you can see that we return most of the income that we get back to the membership or to the community in terms of advocacy, in terms of events, in terms of chapter activities, et cetera. Next slide, John. So this is the projected 22 budget, excuse me, 22 actuals at the end of the year and the budget for 2023. And I wanna go through these each in a little bit of detail. You'll note that advocacy doesn't generate any income for the, for the association, yet it does hopefully generate income for the Fulbright program. And John mentioned the increase in the Fulbright program that we think is directly attributed to the advocacy program. So it's an important part of what we do and something that the board feels very strongly about continuing. You'll note that in income for membership, we expect memberships to go up slightly to 362 next year. Um, the board has cautioned the uh, staff that we're a little worried about a recession, uh, but the staff feels confident, given the six full-time members in the development committee, that the membership will be able to be uh, increased, particularly institutional membership increases, up to 362. As you can see with the conference, the conference basically in terms of income is an income generator. Uh, it covers mostly its own expenses. Note in chapter grants that the chapter income is expected to go down. Uh, the reason that's expected to go down is that we have uh, a proposal to ECA for a chapter grant, but we haven't received that grant yet. So the board has insisted that we only have in the budget things we, uh, we think we can receive grant-wise, uh, not things that are uh, hopeful. The thing, but the only thing in the budget, excuse me, is things we have received or are sure we will receive grant wise. If that chapter grant from ECA comes through, there will be a significant addition to that income level. Uh, and that'll be a significant help, help for the association's chapter programs and general budget. But uh, that grant is not assured, although we think it's a 90% possible probability. The next is the prize, and you'll note that the income pro for the prize budgeted from for 2023 is significantly higher than the income projected at the end of uh, 2022. The reason for that is an accounting change. Uh, John, if you go down to donations with your cursor and point at donations, you'll note that donations have dropped by $100,000. For 2022, the original accounting decision was to include the selling of tables, for instance, in donations. But as we thought about it, we decided that that was actually better included in prize income. So there's $100,000 in income that's listed now for the prize that was in donations. 
which means that we expect the prize to go up slightly, about $20,000, but there's a $120,000 difference there. And the $100,000 comes from just an accounting change from donations <clears throat> to the prize. Another major difference in the budget is the travel program for income. Uh, that's driven simply by the number of trips and the number of participants. So we had one trip this year with a limited number of participants. We're expecting two trips next year with significantly more participants, hence the difference. Um, of course, if that number or that number of trips doesn't occur, that also washes out expenses. So that's basically a wash item in the budget. You'll see that the endowment draw is the same for both years. We figure that endowment draw by looking at the income, the dividends and interest for a three year running period, the past three years. Um, we take an average of that and then we take 90% of that as the estimate or the actual draw. So that's our income projection for this year. And if you take out the $100,000, you'll see that, that that was an accounting change. Um, excuse me. Uh, yeah, if you take, if you take that out, um, you'll see that basically we are at the same point. We, at the point we would have been last year with some small increases in income. Again, we've advised this, the board has advised the staff that we have to be particularly assertive this year because of what we expect happens with the economy. Let me now go to expenses. John, if you'd come to the next slide. You'll note that in our expense budget, advocacy goes up because we're now having an in-person advocacy event. Expenses for membership go up only slightly. Conference expenses also go up just slightly. Chapter expenses stay basically the same. We have cut expenses for the prize because we've taken out some things that were nice, but were not necessary. One illustration of that, for instance, is a separate dessert reception in another room. Now desserts will simply be served at the table along with the regular meal. You'll note that fundraising expenses go down slightly and that administrative expenses go down slightly. And again, we have tried to cut out an additional administrative and fundraising expenses to come to a net budget. The scary thing down at the bottom of the projected 2022 is a deficit projected at $126,000. Um, that's significant. Uh, the staff right now, and that by the way, projection comes from the beginning of December. The staff right now in December is working at increasing memberships and donations, and hopefully we will be able to report to you next year that we actually managed to reduce that deficit, but that's the projected number right now. We've taken the learning from last year and applied it to next year's budget, and next year's budget is projected to be a balanced budget. That then leaves the final question about what do we do about the deficit? We have three sources to make up that deficit. One source is we can decrease our cash reserves. We have significant cash reserves on hand in addition to the endowment. The reason for that is that our expenses and income can be choppy. Choppy meaning that for instance, there is a lot of expense in January and February, normal salary expenses, but those are not good income months. March and April are good income months because of the prize. Similarly, November and December are good income months because that's a typical time when people perhaps renew their memberships or when donations are given. So we are expecting that we will take some of that 126,000 out of cash reserves. But we don't want cash reserves to be too low because then we won't be able to meet regular operating expenses like salaries. We could also take therefore some of that money out of the endowment, or we could take some of that money out of a line of credit, which we have, which actually has never been used. The board has decided that we will make up that deficit on a running basis over the next multiple months as we see the drawdown of cash reserves. And we'll take it out of either the line of credit or the endowment depending upon which is the best, most advantageous financially. That means depending on where, where the markets are and depending on what the interest rates are on the line of credit. We have no way of projecting that right now. Um, 
One final point is uh, these expenses are by program. If you're interested in knowing where our expenses are by accounting categories, the biggest sources of our expenses are naturally salaries and then events like the conference and the prize, um, and then chapters. And those are our sign most significant sources of expenses. So I will stop with my presentation right there and tell you that 2020 was a year in which we were basically at a break-even budget. This year, we have a deficit, which we hope to rectify in the future, and we are looking forward to a good 2023. So I'll take questions, and we'll take questions for you in the question and answer period, and let me turn it back over to Cynthia and John. Thank you so much, Will, and thank you for the hard work that the Finance Committee does. I have been looking at the um, questions and the question and answer. Um, most of them are administrative questions, John. I'm so, happy to answer them. Yeah. So why don't I do this? Why don't I just read the question? And then if Will, if you have anything to add or if I have anything to add, we will do that. But John, why don't you take yeah, the first crack at these questions, OK? Certainly. Does that sound good? That sounds like oh, a plan. It, it does that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, the first thing is I want to say hello back to, to University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Hello back. <laughs> <laughs> hello back. OK. Um, where do you find out more information about creating country interest groups? Great. Uh, thank you for that question, Arthur. Um, we are looking to expand our interest group, interest group uh, reach next year. Um, we have learned, we are learning a lot from the six groups that are operating right now. Uh, and we think this is an area for great growth and engagement. It's, uh, it's an exciting idea. My suggestion is that you reach out to my colleague, Christine Oswald. Uh, Christine is our director for uh, chapters as well as interest groups. Uh, you can reach her at Christine at Fulbright.org. Uh, and Christine would be happy to uh, take in your uh, suggestions specific. You know, for example, I'm an alum from the India program and uh, uh, we're hoping to, at some point to start a group related to India. So, so Arthur, please reach out to Christine and she can uh, give you some direction from there. Oh, great. Um, and, and this is one you can tell Fulbrighters, they're always ready to volunteer. Ready to go. How, how should I volunteer to help with the Fulbright Prize in Advocacy Day? That's, uh, that is a great question. I appreciate that, Catherine. The, um, the uh, early next month, uh, we will be sending out an email to our, our listserv, um, giving you the opportunity to uh, register for tickets at the Fulbright Prize on April 19th. Um, it will also give you the option to uh, participate in Advocacy Day. So these two events are obviously adjacent, hoping that you will do both. So you can both register for a ticket to the prize and sign up for Advocacy Day. But you can also do one and not the other. In other words, you could go to the, the prize and not go to Advocacy Day, which would be a shame, but because it's such a great experience. Or if you don't want to go to the prize, you can certainly join us for Advocacy Day. So throughout the sp spring leading up to April, we will be uh, asking people to, to sign up. Um, right now, without waiting, you could help us with sponsorships for the campaign, which do not have to be massive corporate gifts. They can be smaller uh, efforts uh, for pe people and institutions who want to simply raise their profile in an important um, uh, set of stakeholders. So lots of, lots of uh, communications to come. You can always reach out to us, info at Fulbright.org which goes to Fiona, if you'd like to write to me directly, as I put on the slide, john at fulbright.org, and I'm always happy to hear from you. John, Yvonne wants to know if there's a chapter in Michigan. Uh, there certainly are chapters in Michigan. I believe there are two of them. Um, you, what, uh, 
uh, what Yvonne, you can sort of asking this question for everybody in a way. You can go to Fulbright.org, click on chapters, and as you scroll down just a little bit, you'll see a national map with all of our chapters listed there with contact information, their Facebook pages, their their uh, Fulbrighter app pages, their um, their main uh, online presence, and you can contact them that way. If that proves to be a challenge, you can always, again, send an email to Fiona, full, at info at Fulbright.org, and she can direct you to the right chapter for your area. John, the next question is interesting. It's from Julia, and Julia wants to know about uh, resources that are available for um, international Fulbright uh, alumni associations, and you might want to talk about the commissions there. John. Of course, of course, and uh, and Will might also want to weigh in. Those of you who don't know, Will is the retired uh, executive director of the program in Taiwan, um, and uh, knows a great deal about this. I'll I'll open by saying there are Fulbright associations all over the world. Um, there are probably seventy of them uh, in many different countries. Um, most of them, as Cynthia suggested, uh, co-hosted or supported by. Uh, the uh, Fulbright Commission in that country. Uh, for example, um, the, the association in Japan and in Germany are especially engaged uh, organizations with, with thriving programming. Um, so uh, I don't know if Will wants to add anything to that, but that's, um, that's a, a quick sh sense of, of uh, Fulbrighters engaged around the world. Just real quickly, um, the associate, the international alumni associations are generally for the alumni in that country uh, who are back in that country, although they often include some Americans who have now moved to that country. Um, and I think there's talk in the Fulbright Association of trying to be more active, uh, engaging with all those alumni associations. That is true. There is also um, a big gap um, that I, I mentioned there are 70 uh, uh, around 70 um, such associations, but there are only 49 commissions. So obviously there's some associations not affiliated with those commissions. And then there are, uh, there are about 160 countries that participate in the Fulbright program. So if you do the arithmetic, there are a lot of alumni who have no association home, um, which, is, uh, which is something to consider as we, as we move forward. John, uh, Richard's question is more of Fulbright program question, but the question is, are you envisioning Fulbright opportunities to serve in Ukraine? It's, uh, it's interesting that Richard asked this question because of course it's pressing and important. Um, the, the program in Ukraine has, has been around for many years, a strong commission there, um, obviously struggling in, in light of, of this war. Um, a number of alumni approached me during the conference and asked, you know, can we do anything in Ukraine? And the answer is uh, not clear, to be honest. Uh, we would want to, any activity that this association might take in relation to Ukraine, we would absolutely want to uh, consult with our colleagues at the State Department. We'd want to talk to the F uh, Fulbright Commission. Um, we want to be sure that that's smart, strategic, safe, appropriate. Um, in the meantime, we have, uh, we have been, we have done a number of fundraisers for uh, Ukraine relief organizations. Um, uh, and uh, that has been our main way to support Ukraine at the moment. The next question is from a former board member and, and treasurer, uh, Phil, um, is asking about membership how many members in the Fulbright Association um, divided into both individual and institutional? Sure, right now we have just shy of 8,000 uh, active members, uh, individual members in the Fulbright Association. We are, we are going to be launching a campaign in early 23 to get that number over 10,000. Um, we want to be what we might call uh, Fulbright strong. I think it's important that uh, the association represent more of the alumni in the United States. So um, we hope that uh, everyone on this call will help us 
to drive that agenda forward. We have uh, just shy of 250 um, institutional members. Again, important uh, that we grow that number because the partnership between alumni and the higher ed community is critical for advancing international education, evidently, uh, as well as um, partnering them with them for community outreach and especially advocacy. So our, all of our institutional members benefit from the work that we do in advocating for the Fulbright program, but it's kind of a chicken and egg. The, the more members you have, the more powerful your argument is for representation, the more leverage you have on Capitol Hill. If we can go into any senator's office and say, we represent six higher ed institutions in your state as opposed to one or two, that's a wake up call like, whoa, wait a minute, I, I should be paying attention to this. Yes, you should. So growing both of these er, um, areas is, is important to us strategically. The, the next question is from a friend of mine. We actually worked together when she was at Penn State. She's now in California, I see. Uh, Beverly wants to know about funds provided for Fulbright Prize honorees. For the prize honoree? Is that what we're talking about? That's right. Her question is, are funds provided for Fulbright Prize honorees? Which yes. Of course, they yes, are. The, yes. And the answer to that is yes. Uh, for, <laughs> for many years, we have given a cash award. You'll see this on our website of $50,000 to the Fulbright Laureate or Laureates. Um, and on several occasions, the laureates have declined that gift, uh, which um, uh, we plow back into our, uh, our programming, of course. So, for example, Angela Merkel, when she received the Fulbright Prize uh, several years ago, she was at the time a sitting head of state. That was just not something that was uh, acceptable. So she declined. Um, Bill and Melinda Gates, of course, when they were honorees, um, uh, they declined, as you would, as you might imagine. And the Gates Foundation has been an important partner with us ever since, and and a very generous uh, sponsor of the prize last year. Uh, if I may mention, last year's winner Bono accepted the prize, but those funds went to the uh, not-for-profits that were helping um, with. Um, um, health care and right. all kinds of things. So, yeah, sometimes that occurs too. Right, exactly. Like uh, when we gave the money to um, uh, Doctors Without Borders, they were one of our laureates a number of years ago. Of course, they used that for their programming. So it's, it's all good, right? So the money raised uh, for the prize, it either stays with us to advance our programming or more often, uh, advances uh, the cause uh, associated with the laureate. And that's that's really wonderful. I believe the next question is for Will and it's from Marcella. The question is, can you explain what is involved in the advocacy line item? Sure, that's an expense line item. Um, and you'll see that it went up to, going back to, I think it was 50 some thousand dollars for next year. Um, what goes into that line item, of course, is a prorated portion of salaries of people working on advocacy. So we prorate everybody's salary and put it into the appropriate programmatic box. Um, also going into that, since we're having in-person uh, advocacy this year, there's going to be need to rent a room to do some training or place for people to gather together at the beginning. Uh, there's some uh, expenses associated, event expenses associated with that. Uh, John, anything else I need to Yeah, well, just one thing that we add. This, this year, we've decided to uh, fund a advocacy fellowship um, okay. that will support a, a local graduate student um, who will help us with the logistics of advocacy, helping with scheduling, especially. Um, that uh, we're very excited about that. I'm uh, I've just completed interviews for that position. Some amazing people have applied for this from many different countries, interestingly. Uh, and we have an offer out now. We'll, we'll see if that person uh, takes it, but uh, uh, we expect to fill that right away. It's uh, it, And that expense involves a stipend for that person. 
other things like uh, printing um, technology, uh, you know, that, that's what's in that line. Exactly. Well, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Kyle, and I think you've already answered this, John. He wanted to know how to get connected with one of the existing groups, and you did talk about that, and, and probably the, the best way to is to just contact the office and maybe talk with Christine. Agreed. Okay. The next question is from, again, a, a, a board member, a transitioning board member, um, and wants to know if the State Department ECA has renewed the chapter grants and whether it was at the previous level. Yeah, so I'll speak to 2022 per, uh, to, uh, per Will's um, explanation earlier. Uh, yes, the State Department um, uh, offered a, a strong uh, grant for us this year, actually larger than in previous years. Uh, we want to acknowledge and thank them for that. Uh, covering both <laughs> chapter activities as well as capacity building on uh, on our part. For example, supporting some technology upgrades to be certain that uh, communication, data management, and so on were cutting edge. Um, and uh, um, uh, when you say it at the previous level, and uh, that that's a, a trigger for me at least to uh, to remind folks that the State Department has been has been supporting financially, logistically, strategically, this association for decades um, uh, across uh, all administrations. Um, it's, uh, it's an important partnership. The next couple of, of questions um, have to do with, you know, membership, benefits of membership and, and, and being members of chapter. The first one from Shane is that he never hears from his chapter, which is Northern California, and wants to know if there may be an issue with his membership, because, but he is listed on their list of registrants. So, John, yeah. should he contact the chapter in some way? Yeah, this is a good moment to go ahead and contact our office to be sure that your um, all of your information is correct and that um, uh, the chapter has received that information. Um, Northern California is a, a very active chapter, so I'm surprised there's a little bit of a breakdown in communication there. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, um, a number of our chapters have, uh, during which uh, a lot of our chapters struggled um, because they were so accustomed to in-person programming. So if not in the case of Northern California, but in some cases, it's a little bit like starting up a, a car that hasn't been driven very much. Um, and if there are miscues, we can always fix that and be sure that you're getting the information you need. Okay, thank you, John. Look, uh, Kathleen wants to know that, um, well, first she wants to thank us for this session. She finds it informative and Kathleen, thank you for that. We hope that it, it, it is for everyone. But she also wants to know how she can um, what donations she can submit beyond that, you know, she's a lifetime member or membership, and she wants to get involved with the mentoring program and advocacy. Again, Great. I think this is a contact issue. Yeah, so a couple of things for you, Kathleen. First, um, since we're, uh, we've been talking about finances, it's, it's worth understanding a kind of cash flow issue, which is that uh, a large number of our members about 3,500 members out of the 8,000 are lifetime members, which of course is great. Uh, it's it's a, a lifetime commitment, but it also means that lifetime members have, have provided those dues sometimes 25 years ago. And so we have a lot of lifetime members who since then have been become donors, right? So they're not paying dues anymore, but they're donors. And so, of course, you can go to our website, Fulbright.org, click on Donate, and uh, I either send a check, and all of the information is provided there, or donate electronically. Uh, and again, that could be that could be five dollars, it could be fifty, it could be more. Uh, whatever you would like to do, we would most appreciate um, at any time. Uh, end of the year is fine, but any time you like. Oh, uh, in terms of contacting folks for the mentoring program 
uh, uh, that that is something that Fiona is working on. So again, you can use her uh, her info at Fulbright.org to reach her about mentoring, or you can send it to her own box, which is Fiona at Fulbright.org. Um, all of us use our first name at Fulbright.org uh, to get to us. John, Jean has an interesting question. She asked if you can prepare a template letter that can be used to fundraise for the Fulbright Prize. Yeah, that's a, that is a great idea, Jean. And uh, my colleague, Alicia, who is director for events uh, and uh, an ex the extraordinary leader of our prize and conference uh, um, efforts, um, she could work with you directly if you like. That's Alicia, A-L-I-C-I-A at Fulbright.org. Um, you can also write to prize at Fulbright.org. Um, but my suggestion to all of you is that you visit our Fulbright Prize website. Um, so again, go to programs, pull down, and you'll see the prize. Also, when you first open Fulbright.org, you'll see a tab to, to the prize right there. There are a lot of resources there for, there is a, um, there is our um, prospectus, our sponsorship prospectus there, offering lots of details about levels of sponsorship and what's entailed and more about the, the event. There's a video to give you a sense of the prize event. Um, we have fundraising um, materials there, lots of resources. I am hoping that I am pronouncing Lai Kuhn's name correctly, but um, Lai Kuhn is a teacher at a medical school and would like to promote the Fulbright program to medical students. Is there, he wants to know if there's a particular Fulbright program for medical students. Uh, Will, you might need to help me out on this. Um, I do know, of course, that um, uh, science and medicine are strongly funded by Fulbright Exchange programs. Whether there's one specific for medical students, uh, I don't know. What do you think? What do you? Well, well, the other thing before Will, might that not be great for the specialist program too for medical students? It's possible. That would be a short term thing. It would thing, be a short term one. But and for... if, they're, if they're still in medical school, it might be a, a, one that's available to them. Go ahead, Will. Thoughts? Uh, there are there are programs for medical students. Um, there are 160 plus Fulbright programs around the world. They're distinctive to each country. So the best way to figure that out, what there are, what is available, is to go to the Institute of International Education, IIE.org, and search the programs there for programs in the sciences and for medical students. I know, for instance, in Taiwan, we did not have any. We had lots of scientists uh, in various areas of science, but nothing specifically for medical students. So we would have taken a medical student if the medical student had a proposal that was um, relevant to the goals of the, science, of the Taiwan program. So uh, unfortunately, because there are 160 plus programs and each pro program is slightly distinctive, uh, it's not easy to give you an answer for that. There are no general overall medical school student programs. They are country specific. Thank you so much for, for that, Will. Um, Marcella, again, is thanking the Fulbright Association for the work that that's being done and found that this was very informative. And we wanna thank you, Marcella, and everyone else who has attended. It, it, it's one of the, the best things as, as board members, I think I can speak for the board, is to be a part of this and to be, be a part of Fulbrighters and to have Fulbrighters so excited about what we're doing. So we thank you for being a part of this. There are a couple of other questions, a lot of them can be answered by um, contacting the office because a lot of people want to know which chapter is closest to them and they want to get involved and we want them to be involved so please feel free to contact the office i see that our time though is is past we we try to let you go at one o'clock according to my watch it's 104 so 
again, we want to thank you for being here, for participating, for being the people that Fulbrighters are. Thank you so much. Will, do you have any closing remarks, John, before we say goodbye? No, just thanks everybody for their support and, and continue to support the association and the, the vision and mission of the Fulbright program, which is a world with a little more knowledge and a little less conflict. Amen to that. I, I would just uh, thank Cynthia and Will for their uh, contributions and help today uh, to uh, my team, um, to uh, everyone who has been so supportive this year. Uh, a, a great year and a great uh, a new great year is about to start. So stay engaged, stay in touch, and uh, and happy holidays. Thank you. Happy holidays, everyone. Take care. Bye -bye. And thanks again.